Hello, it's Susie again, and we are going to continue reading from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And when we left off last, the four children had entered the wardrobe and found themselves themselves in snowy Narnia. And it wasn't long before they were there that Edmund mistakenly revealed that he had been there as well once before, and they were a little angry with him. But they were also wondering, well, what should we do? Where should we go? And that's when Lucy suggested they look for Mr. Tumnus. And when they reached his house, they realized that it had been ransacked, and there was even a notice that said that he had been arrested. And so they were very confused of what to do at that point. And it seemed as if there was a robin that was flying and leading them further into the forest. And then the, uh, the robin disappeared and they saw a beaver. And the beaver signaled for them to follow him. And he let them know that he was to look out for them. Mr. Tumnus had given him uh, Lucy's old handkerchief as proof that he was her friend and their friend. So he took them to his house where they had dinner with him and his wife, Mrs. Beaver. And that's where we will continue with chapter eight, what happened after dinner. And now said Lucy, please do tell what happened to Mr. Thomas. Ah, oh, that's bad, said Mr. Beaver, shaking his head. That's a very, very bad business. There's no doubt he was taken off by the police. I got that from a bird who saw it done. But where's he been taken to, asked Lucy. Well, they were heading northward when they were last seen, and we all know what that means. No, we don't, said Susan. Mr. Beaver shook his head in a very gloomy fashion. I'm afraid it means... That they were taking him to her house, he said. But what will they do to him, Mr. Beaver, gasped Lucy. Well, said Mr. Beaver, you can't exactly say for sure, but there's not many taken in there that ever comes out again. Statues, all full of statues, they say it is, in the courtyard and up the stairs and in the hall. People she's turned, he paused and shuddered, turned into stone. But Mr. Beaver, said Lucy, can't we, I mean, we must do something to save him. It's too dreadful, and it's all on my account. I don't doubt you'd save him if you could, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver, but you've no chance of getting him, getting into that house against her will, and ever coming out alive. Couldn't we have some stratagem, said Peter? I mean, couldn't we dress up as something or pretend to be, oh, peddlers or anything? Or watch until she's gone? Or, or oh, hang it all, there must be some way. This fawn saved my sister at his own risk, Mr. Beaver. We can't just leave him to be, to be, to have that done to him. It's no good, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver. No good you're trying, of all people. But now that Aslan is on the move... Oh, yes, tell us about Aslan, said several voices at once, for once again that strange feeling, like the first signs of spring, like good news, had come over all of them. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan? said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole, whole wood, but not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's. But the word is that it's reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the white queen. He'll settle, settle her all right. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn, turn him into stone, said Edmund. Lord love you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face, it'll be the most she can do, and more than I expect of her. No, no, she'll, he'll put all to rights, as it says in an old rhyme in these parts. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, 
winter meets its death, and when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But shall we see him? asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, that's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you where we shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. That's right, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver, bringing his paw down on the table with a crash that made all the cups and saucers shake. And so you shall. Word has been sent that you are to meet him, tomorrow if you can, at the stone table. Where's that, said Lucy. I'll show you, said Mr. Beaver. It's down the river, a good step from here. I'll take you to it. But meanwhile, what about poor Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. The quickest way you can help him is by going to meet Aslan said Mr. Beaver. Once he's with us, then we can bring, begin doing things. Not that we don't need you to. That's another of the old rhymes. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. So things must be drawing near their end now. He's come and you've come. We've heard of Aslan coming into these parts before, long ago, nobody can say when, but there's never been any of your race here before. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch human herself? Oh, she'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver, and it's on that that she bases her claim to be queen. But she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's, and here Mr. Beaver bowed, your father Adam's first wife, her that they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side, and on the other side she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company. But there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. I've known good dwarfs, said Mrs. Beaver. So have I now that you've come to speak of it, said her husband. But precious few, and they were the ones least like men. But in general, take my advice. When you meet anything that's going to be human and isn't, or used to be human once and isn't now, or ought to be human and isn't, you keep your eyes on it and feel for your hatchet. And that's why the witch is always on the lookout for any humans in Narnia. She's been watching for you this many a year, and if she knew there were four of you, she'd be more dangerous still. What's that to do with it? asked Peter. Because of another prophecy, said Mr. Beaver. Down at Care Paravel, there's, that's the castle on the seacoast down at the mouth of this river, which ought to be the capital of the whole country, if all was as it should be. Down at Care Paravel, there are four thrones, and it's a saying in Narnia that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit in those four thrones, 
then it will be the end, not only of the White Witch's reign, but of her life. And that is why we had to be so cautious as we came along. For if she knew about you four, your lives wouldn't be worth a shake of my whiskers. All the children had been attending so hard to what Mr. Beaver was telling them that they had not noticed anything else for a long time. Then, during the moment of silence that followed his last remark, Lucy suddenly said, I say, where's Edmund? There was a dreadful pause, and everyone began asking, Who saw him last? How long has he been missing? Is he outside? And then all rushed to the door and looked out. The snow was falling thickly and steadily. The green ice of the pool had vanished under a thick white blanket, and from where the little house stood in the center of the dam, you could hardly see either bank. Out they went, plunging well over their ankles into the soft new snow, and went round the house in every direction. Edmund, Edmund, they called until they were hoarse. But the silently falling snow seemed to muffle their voices, and there was not even an echo in answer. How perfectly dreadful, said Susan, as they at last came back in despair. Oh, how I wish we had never come. What are we on earth are we to do, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. Do, said Mr. Beaver, who was already putting on his snow boots. Do, we must be off at once. We haven't a moment to spare. We'd better divide into four search parties, said Peter, and all go in different directions. Whoever finds him must come back here at once and... Search parties, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver. What for? Why, to look for Edmund, of course. There's no point in looking for him, said Mr. Beaver. What do you mean, said Susan? He can't be far away yet, and, and we've got to find him. What do you mean when you say there's no looking for him? The reason there's no use looking, said Mr. Beaver, is that we already know where he's gone. Everyone stared in amazement. Don't you understand, said Mr. Beaver? He's gone to her, to the White Witch. He has betrayed us all. Oh, surely, oh, really, said Susan. He can't have done that. Can't he, said Mr. Beaver, looking very hard at the three children, and everything they wanted to say died on their lips for each felt suddenly quite certain inside that this is exactly what Edmund had done. But will he know the way? asked Peter. Has he been to this country before? asked Mr. Beaver. Has he ever been here alone? Yes, said Lucy, almost in a whisper. I'm afraid he has. And did he tell you what he'd done or who he had met? Well, no, he didn't, said Lucy. Then, mark my word, said Mr. Beaver, he has already met white, the White Witch and joined her side and been told where she lives. I didn't like to mention it before, he being your brother and all. But the moment I set eyes on that brother of yours, I said to myself, treacherous. He had that look of one who has been with the witch and eaten her food. You can always tell them, if you've lived long enough in Narnia, something about their eyes. All the same, said Peter in a rather choking sort of voice, we'll still have to go and look for him. He is our brother, after all, even if he is rather a little beast, and he's only a kid. Go to the witch's house, said Mrs. Beaver. Don't you see that the only chance of saving either him or yourselves is to keep away from her? How do you mean, said Lucy? Why, all she wants is to get all four of you. She's thinking all the time of these four thrones at Care Paravel. Once you were all four inside her house, her job would be done, and there'd be four new statues in her collection before you had time to speak. But she'll keep him alive as long as he's only got him because she'll want to use him as a decoy, as bait to catch the rest of you with. Oh, can no one else help us? wailed Lucy. 
Only Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. We must go and meet him. That's our only chance now. It seems to me, my dears, said Mrs. Beaver, that it is very important to know just when he slipped away. How much he can tell her depends on how much he heard. For instance, had we started talking about Aslan before he left? If not, then we may do very well, for she won't know what Aslan has. She won't know that Aslan has come to Narnia, or that we are meeting him, and will be quite off her guard as far as that is concerned. I don't remember him being here when we were talking about Aslan, began Peter, but Lucy interrupted him. Oh, yes, he was, she said miserably. Don't you remember? It was he who asked whether the witch could turn Aslan into stone, too. So he did, by Jove, said Peter. Just the sort of thing we would he would say, too. Worse and worse, said Mr. Beaver, and the next thing is this. Was he still here when I told you that the place for meeting Aslan was the stone table? And, of course, no one knew the answer to this question. Because if he was, continued Mr. Beaver, then she'll simply sledge down in that direction and get between us and the stone table and catch us on our way down. In fact, we shall be cut off from Aslan. But that isn't what she'll do first, said Mrs. Beaver. Not if I know her. The moment Edmund tells her that we're all here, she'll set out to catch us this very night. And if he's been gone about a half an hour, she'll be here in another 20 minutes. You're right, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband. We must all get away from here. There's not a moment to lose. And so now, chapter nine, in the witch's house. And now, of course, you want to know what happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation and hadn't enjoyed it much either because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan, and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door. For the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle. And just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the white witch wasn't really human at all, but half a djinn and half a giantess, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brother and sisters to be turned into stone. He did not want Turkish he did want Turkish delight and to be prince and later a king and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself but he managed to believe, or to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to him, them, because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are the, her enemies, and probably half isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she is rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than awful at than the awful Aslan. At least that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse. However, for deep down inside of him, he really knew that the White Witch 
was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling round him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone. And for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner, and the winter days were very short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it. So he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam. Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute, and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then, too, there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puddles and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and barking his, his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, when I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do is to make some decent roads. And of course, that set him off thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have and how many cars and all about his private cinema and where the principal railways would run and what laws he would make against beavers and dams and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place when the weather changed. First, the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon, and shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day. Only the shadows were rather confusing. He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he got to the other river. You remember he had seen, when they first arrived at the Beavers, a small river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up, but the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one that he had just left, and much overgrown with bushes, so that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through, for he had to stoop under branches and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And every time this happened, he thought more and more how he hated Peter, just as if all this had been Peter's fault. But at last, he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of a little plain between two hills, he saw what might, must have been the white witch's house and the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces caps or sorcerers caps, and they shone in the moonlight, and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house. But it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep, newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right round to the far side before he found it. It was a huge arch but had the great iron gates stood wide open. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside into the courtyard 
and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion crouched as if it was ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his knees shaking and knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if he had not been ch chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know, but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then, at last, he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. Now he saw, from the way the lion was standing, that it couldn't have been looking at him at all. But supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Aha, thought Edmund, when it springs at the dwarf, then will be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. But still, what's going on? Edmund at last remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he thought that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course, it must only be a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow. Then, very slowly, and with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now, he hardly dared to touch it, but at last he put out his hand very quickly and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan that they were all talking about. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of all their fine ideas about him. Who? Who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Then he said, Yeah, silly old Aslan. How do you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble staring up in the moonlight that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it all. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there, rather as the pieces standing on a chessboard when it is halfway through a game. There were stone satyrs, and stone wolves, and bears, and foxes, and catamountains of stone. There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women, but who were really the spirits of trees. There were the great shape of a centaur and a winged horse and a long, lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there, perfectly lifelike and also perfectly still. In the bright, cold moonlight that it was eerie work crossing the courtyard, right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. 
He went to it. There was a flight of stone steps going up to an open door, and Edmund went up them. Across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right, it's all right, he kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf. It can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly, the huge creature rose, with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great red mouth and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. My name is Edmund, and I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day, and I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close in the beaver's house. She, she wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently the gray wolf, Mogren, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars full, as the courtyard had been, of statues. The one nearest the door was a little fawn with a very sad expression on its face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close beside this sat the white witch. I'm come, your majesty, said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. How dare you come alone, said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not tell you to bring the others with you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I've done the best I can. I've brought them quite close. They're in the little house on top of the dam just up the river with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. A slow, cruel smile came over the witch's face. Is that all your news? she asked. No, your majesty, said Edmund, and proceeded to tell her all he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What? Aslan, cried the queen. Aslan, is this true? If I find that you have lied to me... Please, I'm only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer attending to him, clapped her hands. Instantly, the same dwarf whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sledge, ordered the witch, and use the harness without bells. And that is the end of chapter 9. And so next time we'll start again with chapter 10.